Welcome to the third in the series of storytelling cafes that are a collaboration between Sewing Cafe Lancaster and Lancaster Black History Group. Um, so we're telling stories um, in these events as part of a project that Sewing Cafe Lancaster are going to create a banner from the research coming out of the Lancaster Black History Group Community Research Project. Please do look at our other videos uh, in the series for more information um, about this project. So this morning we have two um, stories, main stories to share with you. The first is from a group from Lancaster Priory, uh, Lancaster Priory Women's Group and East Meets West Group. And they've been working on the Safafwaite family tree and they're going to begin uh, the, the event today with their storytelling. So we've got Rachel, Reem and Alana, and I think Rachel is going to begin. Yeah, hi, hi everyone, I'm Rachel. Um, yeah, so I was mostly doing the family tree for the Saturday family. Um, so I sort of, we were face, um, focusing on two particular members, uh, Benjamin and then his son, uh, John. Um, so they were the sort of the two um, key characters that we were sort of basing our family tree around. Um, I did go back to 1599 on my family tree. So I went back to Benjamin's great grandfather. Um, and so they were a, a key Quaker family in Lancaster. Um, but his Benjamin's great grandfather originated from Hawkshead area. Um, and there were quite a lot of um Satterthwaite families in that area so they all appear to be sort of linked um in some way or another but they just sort of um branch off into different um family trees um so I just did the main line um and so um I've done about six generations in total um and so they came from the Hawkshead and eventually at one point um they moved to Lancaster um I believe it was the youngest son of the, the great grandfather um, who moved to Lancaster. Um, and later on, there was also a Leeds connection as well. Um, but through marriage um, of um, Benjamin himself married somebody called Jane in Leeds and they were living in Leeds. Um, so there's the Hawkshead connection and then there's also a Leeds connection coming in. Um, and so just a little bit about Hawkshead as well, this little village they were living in. Um, it has one of the oldest Quaker meeting houses um, built in 1688 um, and it's what was the northernmost parish of Lancaster obviously it's, now it's in Cumbria um, so that's why we can see all the archives from that area in the Lancaster archives um, and there was also another village nearby called Swarthmore which had a 16th century meeting house as well um, okay um, so then Benjamin's son, John, so this is the second of the two people we were closely looking at. Um, he married a woman whose family are, um, was the family of Rawlins, not Rawlinson, but Rawlins. Um, and their family owned quite a few um, plantations in St. Kitts out in the Caribbean. Um, and so his wife was called Mary, um, but her pet sort of um, nickname was Polly. Um, so she comes up as both, a bit confusing. Um, so they own several plantations and the fortune seems to have been made from what I can see by her father, Stedman Rawlins, um, senior. Um, it's quite tricky to, um, navigate through the, that, their family tree. I also then branched out into their family tree because every generation has a Stedman Rawlins. So that sort of made it a bit complicated to look through. Um, but I've looked at where the, um, their plantations were in St Kitts and sort of who, wh which family member it passed to and from. Um, and they also ended up receiving compensation for the enslaved people that they owned. Um, and this would have been a pretty important alliance between the two families um, because the Satterthwaite, excuse me, were mostly involved in the trading of the commodities between England and the Caribbean, whereas the Rawlins were producing the products. I I want to say that it's sugar, but I've not completely looked at that yet. Um, but I think it would have been sugar that they were uh, producing. Um, and so then, so that would have been a, a, an important alliance to have made between the two families. Um, there's also a link with a black 
servant um, that I believe Reem has been looking into. She's called Frances Elizabeth Johnson, who you may have come across already. Um, and the link is through this Mary Polly Rawlins that our John Satterthwaite married. Um, I think Reem's going to speak a bit more about that. Got you? Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, hi, uh, I'm uh, going to today to talk about three stories for three women of uh, the, um, uh, as a black servant women they be in Lancaster. The first story is for Frances Elizabeth Johnson, a black woman servant to Mr. John Satterthwaite and his wife, Ollie uh, Rollinson. She was from Satgate in the east, uh, in the West Indies, came to Lancaster at her 17th in 1768. Uh, she baptized when she is 27 years old in uh, the Priory. She was one of the favorite slaves owned by Satterthwaite family. When she died, they cut her hands and kept as woman too. The hand was buried in 1996 when dear Eliza, when Eliza dear, came, uh, she's one of the Satterthwaite family, bring it back to Lancaster to bury. No one knew about Fanny uh, until her hands is uh, buried in the Priory. Uh, the, second, the second story I will talk about it is Molly. She came with the Francis Elizabeth Johnson in the same voyage, but she, did, she died after one month from her arrival. There are the there uh, uh, Molly and Frances Elizabeth is just uh, the two women in that voyage with the twenty men. There is no any information about the cause of death or where she was serving. Since there is no information about Frances Elizabeth's life with the Satterthwaite family, we have looked at another story about a black servant who worked with the family in Bristol close to that time. The servant is called Fanny Cooker. Fanny is born in um, 1767 on Mountain Rivers Plantation in the West Indies uh, and owned by Penny's family. When Fanny was 14 years old, she was first trained as seamstress, then schooled and instruct in, in domestic duties and the duties of maid servant. She was afraid by John Benny in 1778. Fanny Cooker was one of the few slaves released for reason other than old age or illness. She remained in a service as a maid of Benny's wife, Jane. In 1783, Fanny, 16 years old, sealed to London, uh, to, um, having left behind her family and her home country to live in a totally different place. Staying a few months in London, then moved to Bristol with Benny's family who lived at 7 Great George Street. She was the longest serving in Benny's house. When Jane Benny became pregnant, she also undertook duties as a nursemaid. There is, is uh, a story in the, in, uh, with, uh, in, uh, for Fanny Cooker. Um, uh, when Johnny Penny asked her to accompany her wife, his wife, to Nevis, which is a land in the Caribbean, um, in the Caribbean, uh, she refused. Then after a treat of dismissal, she agreed. In that trip, she saw her family and sibling also brought some gift for them. She kept in touch with, the, with her family after she returned and made friends with the slaves brought from neighbors. Fanny was bait during her time in the service uh, of Benny's family and Mr. John Benny invested her money. After his death, he recommended that Fanny be paid a monthly student uh, on a condition that she remained in the service of his wife. Shortly after his death, Fanny died aged 52 years old in 1920 without children or family. She left uh, some money and some things all given to her family. 
and her friends. We mentioned these stories to give, to give some idea about how is the life for the black women servant in that time. Over to you. Thank you, Reem. Yeah. Alana. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Alana. Um, I've just finished my undergraduate degree at Lancaster University. Um, for the past few months, I've been the research buddy for the East Meets West Priory Group, uh, as who you as will, uh, will know have been researching the Saturday family's connection to the slave trade and economies. Um, as part of my role, I've extensively studied the Sathwaite letter books consisting of three diaries titled volume one, two, and three. The first two volumes included letters by Benjamin Sathwaite from 1737 to 1777, and the final diary by his son, John, from 1781 to 1782. The letter books were kindly presented to Lancaster University by the Sathwaite family, and the Lancaster Library have since transcribed them. The aim of this section of the presentation is for me to provide you with an insight into the types of commodities traded between Lancaster and the West Indies, how they impacted upon the economic prosperity of Lancaster and surrounding regions, as well as providing examples from the letter books. The information provided is part, is part of a collaborative piece between myself and another member of the research group called Hillary, who couldn't make it to the session today. So when considering the slave economies, you might think of the exploitation and commodification of black people aboard voyages from West Africa to the West Indies and Americas. This devastating narrative positions Lancaster and Britain in general as distant from the suffering of slavery, thus exonerating Britain from their involvement in the slave trade. Nevertheless, Lancaster and neighbouring areas have deep connections to the triangular trade in which enslaved people were traded for goods and commodities that advanced the economic infrastructures in Lancaster and the West Indies. From the letter book um, and Schofield's work on commodities, it became significantly apparent that food and clothes were amongst the necessities exported from Lancaster to the West Indies to either sell at markets or for general use. Such food provisions were not provided to enslaved people working on plantations as they were expected to grow their own food. There are an array of products sent to the West Indies, for instance, pork and beef, which were salted for preservation, butter and fish like salmon, ling and herring. In a letter, Benjamin Sathwaite wrote to Thomas Hutton Rawlinson in the first volume of the letter books in 1740, um, regarded the condition of beef and butter following the journey across the Atlantic Ocean and how this will impact upon his success in the market. These concerns were also hugely present throughout the second volume of the letter books, where Benjamin worried about the conditions of the trading market in Kingston, Jamaica. This demonstrates how integrated Benjamin was within the slave economies and how he was not only involved in the commodification and trading of enslaved people, but goods from Lancaster to the West Indies. On the other hand, the goods imported back into Lancaster and their impact on local and regional life were tantamount to that of exports. One prominent example is the use of mahogany from the West Indies to, the, to manufacture domestic items and furniture for wealthy families in Lancaster and beyond. Their furniture business prospered in Lancaster with Robert Gillow's company, Gillow's & Co, providing furniture for distinguished families. For example, delivering furniture to Benjamin Sathwaite for his own personal use in the, so in the 19, oh, 1740s. <laughs> um, so overall, this section, despite it being shot, has established that trading was not detached from Lancaster and surrounding areas. These regions were considerably immersed within exporting and importing goods, whilst silently reaping the benefits of economic development and industrialization. So now I'll pass over to Professor Imogen Tyler, who will present on the Dent 108 story. Thanks, Alana. And, and as we start to gather together our research from the Slavery Family Trees Project, and that the, the blogs and the family trees will collect and be published on our, on our website. And I put a link to that uh, in the chat. So we're sharing this preliminary research with you today. And um, so the story I'm gonna tell, I think Victoria's got some slides, my slides that she's gonna kindly share for me, uh, is about a runaway slave um, from Dent. So, the story I'm going to tell is based on research, um, mostly by someone called Audrey Dewey, 
and the work of a local historian in Sedba called Diane Elfek. And you can read Audrey's original blog about the Dent Runaway, Thomas Anson, on the Runaway Slows database that I'll come to in a moment. But the reason I wanted to share this story with you at Lancaster Sewing Cafe is it illustrates how 18th and 19th century slavery business not only penetrated Lancaster town, but the whole of the Loon Valley up to and into the Yorkshire Dales. And it transformed local economies and livelihoods in ways which I think it's difficult for us to see or comprehend in the present. But it also has an additional layer of meaning for me as I was brought up in Dent and I've known about this story for 35 years. So Dent, next slide, is a remote dale in the Yorkshire Dales National Park and it's in Cumbria today and because the counties have all changed but it was in West Riding of Yorkshire um, when Thomas Anson ran away from here. It's an extremely beautiful and remote place. It's popular with walkers and holiday makers and it seems odd to say it and it makes me feel ancient but growing up in a remote community like Dent in the 1980s is quite difficult to explain to young people today because it was a period before the internet and before mobile phones transformed communication and transform life in isolated rural communities. We had phone landlines and we had television stations, three of them, and we had patchy access to radio stations. We had printed local newsletters, notice boards, and we had a lot of gossip and talk. And that's centered around the village post office, shop, pub, cafes, and street. So when you walked around a place like Dent as a teenager, and I walked a lot and hitchhiked a lot as we didn't have a bus service, you regularly would come across tractors and cars pulled over in the middle of the road with windows pulled down and the occupants sharing the news. And I think this is a reminder that these are deeply oral word of mouth economies. That is folk history and stories about people, families, about places and about animals continue to be passed down by word of mouth in ways which were perhaps not so central in larger towns and cities. And from the age of 13, I worked in local pubs and cafes and I'd be told and would overhear stories about Dent's connection to slavery historically. And one of these stories centred on two houses in the Dale, West House, which should by then be re renamed as Wernside Manor, and a remote farmhouse called Rig End. I was told, and lots of people will have heard these stories or read about them uh, locally, that a group of enslaved people was brought to Dent from the West Indies and that they'd been murdered or had died. Some said that some enslaved people had drowned at a place on the river called Black Dub and were buried at a secret location in the Dale. Um, some said that the River Dee that runs through Dent Dale turns red with the blood of the enslaved people. And it did quite often turn red after periods of heavy rain, stained by peat. And after being told this story as a teenager, I was always disconcerted when I turned on the bath taps and saw red water filling up the tub. I was told by an elderly woman a repeated story that there was black ancestry in families in the Dale. Which families, I would ask, and they would say, you know which ones. When I was 15 and at secondary school, I decided to do my independent history project about the transatlantic slave trade and to focus the project on Dent and the surrounding area. There was very little material to go on in those days before the internet with only a meagre school library. But I went to talk to some local historians. And I spent a lot of time walking around the village and the local area and towns, uh, nearby towns. I visited Sunderland Point for the first time and went to Sambo's grave, which many of you, probably all of you will know something about. And it's at this time I first heard the name Thomas Anson, the name of a runaway slave man who lived in Dent, uh, which local histories researchers in the area uh, told me about and they showed me a copy of this advert which reads, run away from Dent in Yorkshire on Monday the 8th, uh, 28th of August last, Thomas Anson, a Negro man, about five feet six inches high, about 20 years or upwards and broad set. Whoever will bring the said man back to Dent or give any information that he be had again shall receive a handsome reward 
from Mr. Edmund Sill of Dent or Mr. David Kenyon Merchant in Liverpool. The second time I heard the name Thomas Anson in my life was when the Runaway Slave database was published a few years ago by researchers at the University of Glasgow. So now looking back, I'm beginning to try and disentangle some of the oral history and folklore that I grew up with and have a look about um, some into more detail and some of the historical facts we do have about Dent and its connections to the slavery business. The Runaway Slave Database contains about 800 runaway adverts published in English and Scottish newspapers between 1700 and 1780, and more continue to be added. What we know from the database is that there were a significant number of people in colour in 18th century Britain. As the um, database reads, most were African or African descent, a smaller number were South Asian, and a few were Indigenous Americans. Many had been brought by their masters from Africa, the Caribbean, North America and South Asia, normally to work as domestic servants, sometimes as craftsmen or sailors. A few were free, others were legally bound to work for their masters for set periods and some were enslaved. I find the database deeply moving as these newspaper adverts are often the only traces we have the only evidence of lives of bound or enslaved people. Um, of course, most enslaved or bound people wouldn't have run away. So many more li lives remain completely unrecorded. So it's so, so significant to have this resource that we can look at um, this open access resource. The database says the men, women and children who ran away in an attempt to free themselves inadvertently generated records of themselves, providing remarkable resources which can tell us much about them and their lives. Please do look at um, the database. So the Sill family were who um, appeared to own the runaway Thomas Anson were farmers in Dent, but they weren't just um, you know, they, they were more than just farmers. They organized some of the local textile industry that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. And they went into the plantation business, into sugar in Jamaica. So the first most significant person is John Sill, the first, who was a planter and slave owner in Jamaica. And he died in Jamaica in 1774. Thomas, I remember, ran away in 1758. And it's his brother, John's brother, Edmund, who's the one named in the runaway slave advert. Um, so we know that this plantation was called Providence um, and that in 1774, it had 266 enslaved people uh, living there. We also know that John Sill owned a store in Kingston in Jamaica. Um, so we, there's some contempt, some adverts we can look at where he's advertising to sell goods from his saw um, assault advert. And then there's Edmund's children who inherit um, from this uh, these two wealthy brothers, uh, another Edmund, another John, and a James and a Nan, and I'll come to them in a minute, but they all post-date Thomas the runaway. And this was Sill's main farmhouse, but they owned property around Dent and they bought up more property with their profits, which is Rigend or High Rigend. Uh, I know it as Rigend uh, in Deep Dell and Dent. So the Sill family had farming properties, but they also were organizing, as I said, some of the cottage industry and Dent was famous for knitting. Um, they, the Sills would have distributed raw materials, the wool, and also bought up the finished articles and taken them to market and sold them on. So they were what's called mercers, uh, people who were kind of merchants in, in the um, woolen trade. And knitting was really significant in Dent. Everybody knitted, children, women, men. And you know, they had a way of knitting that you could knit while you carried on with uh, your other task that you put your knitting needle in a special holdle uh, on a belt. And if you go to Dent De De Heritage Centre, they've got uh, displays of the, of the knitting, uh, the wooden uh, sticks that were used for knitting. And they particularly knitted a yarn called Bump, uh, 
which is kind of fit greasy yarn, although they would knit finer wool for special items. Now it's such an important industry in Dent that children from other bits of the country and surrounding region were sent to live in Dent so they could learn the trade. And it was a kind of early kind of sweatshop system where um, reports were that, that these children sent to these knitting schools were quite badly treated. And we could tell another runaway story that's been recorded about some children who ran away from Dent, uh, who were sent there to learn knitting uh, called Betty and Sally Udale in the 1760s. So we've got kind of two runaway stories actually overlapping, but I'm not going to concentrate on Thomas's story today. And these knitted goods were very likely used as part of either the transatlantic slave trade as finished goods to trade with in Africa, uh, and Melinda Elder writes about how, how significant these goods were uh, as trade goods and possibly um, in particular these caps that were knitted in Dent, Dent called bump caps may have been used to trade with local African merchants and chiefs so these are kind of caps that Muslim men were um, but definitely we, we can say with some certainty that these knitted and manufactured goods, including goods with Dent, would have been on ships going out of Lancaster and Liverpool uh, to trade with um, bilaterally in the West Indies. OK, and we have Mercers investing in Lancaster slave ships, including at least one from Dent to I'll come to in a moment. So we only have evidence for Thomas Anson in Dent, but it is possible, and the oral history certainly suggests, that other enslaved people were brought to Dent by the Sills to work as servants and labourers. If this was the case, they likely would have knitted as well, because everybody knitted whatever their main job might have been. Um, and towards the end of the 17th century, the Sill family had, had turned West House, which was originally an older farmhouse, and rebuilt it into a manor house. Huge, it's lavishly furnished manor house, furnished in mahogany, uh, the latest fashionable Georgian style. Oral history says that the stone that built West House was possibly quarried by enslaved labour, but there's no evidence for that. Um, but that is a very strong story growing up in, in Dent. And this house is called Wernside Manor, you can see it here. And this is a monument you can see here to John Sill. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not telling you to switch slides. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, this is a monument to John Sill. This is West House or Wernside Manor. I'm sorry, Victoria. Next slide. So other dent involvement uh, in the trade that we we um, that Melinda Elder and the Slave Voyages database can tell us about. So not just the sills. We have Miles Mason, a mercer, another cotton a woolen goods seller, and, uh, who's a ship, slave ship investor in Lancaster, and he becomes uh, actually the mayor of Lancaster. Um, and, and has a family connection also to that house, uh, West House, that becomes Wernside Manor. And we also have a George Capstick, who is a slave ship captain, uh, who actually dies in command of a slave ship, um, who also comes from Dent. So in this very small village, we have these other connections that I'm still researching to um, the transatlantic slave trade. And um, so it's perhaps through these other connections, we can start to think about how Thomas might have arrived uh, in Dent, possibly on a ship, possibly as a teenager, and, and, and come to end up being brought back, perhaps from Lancaster, perhaps from Liverpool to Dentdale. Next slide. So Anne Sill uh, ends up, this is a long time later, after Thomas Anson's long gone, uh, becoming the only living heir of the uh, Sill family, inheriting the Jamaican sugar wealth. And she's the one that on the abolition of slave ownership is compensated um, for uh, those enslaved people in Jamaica to the tune of approximately 1.5 million when she died. Now she, when she died in 69, she hadn't received the money uh, and the claim was resubmitted by her executors, who were also the beneficiaries at this point. And they included the, the Dent-born geologist, Adam Sedgwick, who's probably the most famous um, of the people from Dent, 
um, and he was awarded around half a million pounds. And Sedgwick was a very religious man and an abolitionist. Um, so we have this, again, we see this time and again, this contradiction between people inheriting money through the slavery business who themselves were publicly um, abolitionists. And I wonder how that would have sat with um, Adam Sedgwick. Next slide. So Thomas Anson, and this is, this is Audrey Jew, um, Dewey's words. How did he get away? Where did he go? Did he succeed in evading recapture after he escaped from Dent? And, I, and, and she writes, I've wondered about his fate for well over 20 years and I know how she feels because I've wondered about it since I was a teenager. Uh, what happened to Thomas Anson? Did he escape from Dent? And actually how he escaped is, is such a remote place. How did um, somebody um, who was an enslaved African escape from this remote place? How did he get away? You know, um, it, it, it's incredible um, when you start to think about what that actually means to, to run away from somewhere as remote as this at, at this time. And she writes, imagine my delight when I discovered that Thomas Anson, born in Africa, had been discharged from the fourth degree uh, dragoons in 1768, age 30. As the name and age fit the details in the runaway advertisement, he joined the regiment in 1760 and served eight years as a trumpeter. The dragoons were mounted regiments. Thomas Anson would have been dressed in an elaborate uniform and ridden a fine horse. He was discharged to pension. In 1768, after eight years service, because he'd lost a tooth, which no doubt meant that he could no longer blow his trumpet. At least he had the benefit of a continued income and therefore wouldn't be completely destitute. So incredibly, this is really unusual. We know that Thomas Anson wasn't recaptured. He wasn't returned to Liverpool or to Dent, but he managed to join this regiment, the, the Dragoons, who actually were moving between Scotland uh, and London and other places in this period. And there was a sub substantial minority of black soldiers who belonged to the Dragoons, but particularly to musical corps uh, in this period. So as early as 1714, there's evidence of black um, soldiers. And also around the time Thomas Anson appears in the records, that other runaways we can see who, who are joining um, the, the dragoons. Um, so it's an incredible to think that he, you know, here he is in London in 1768 on a pension and hopefully he had a long life. So I put the next slide, some further reading uh, for people who are interested in this story, but go, do go and read uh, Audrey, the Audrey Dewey um, article that, that a lot of this is based in. Um, and I'm really happy to answer any questions as best I can about um, Dent, Thomas Anson and Runaways. But it's a kind of little glimpse and a, and a sign, I think, of people's resistance to the slavery business, but also how deeply extended um, the Liverpool and Lancaster slave trades and slavery business was into rural economies in the area, including things like um, the famous knitters of Dent in the 18th century. Uh, Imogen, that's brilliant, but can we look at the slides we've missed? Sorry. You can. So, um, Victoria, do you want to go back to the beginning and just move through them slowly? So this is the runaway advert and the next slide is the Runaway Slaves uh, database, which is just a link to that database for you to look at. The next slide is the Sills farmhouse. So this is High Rig um, or Rig End farmhouse in Dent. And, and just a list of the, um, the family, the basic family tree and where you can see the brothers. Uh, the next slide is just about the knitters of Dent. So, it's some information uh, with some sources um, around um, dent knitters uh, or the terrible knitters of dent, as they were called. Um, 
and you can actually I put on this slide which I can make available to you you can watch some oral history videos of of um elders in Dent talking about knitting uh and the knitting business and they talk tell the story um actually of the runaway children Betty and Sally Udale in the 1760s um who ran away from a Dent knitting school and talked about the terrible treatment that they'd suffered and that story was retold by Roberts um survey the poet um so I think there's something, there's some work for, to do, probably for me to do around that connection between Mercers and um, these finished goods and their use in both the transatlantic slave trade and the bilateral trade. Um, and I've just started looking into that, um, what evidence there might be uh, for making that connection firmer at the moment. Um, but certainly Melinda Elder suggests that the that these finished goods and these woolen goods would have been a kind of key commodity in trading uh, and bilateral trade and, 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 pro and probably transatlantic slave trade. The next slide, which is, we, we, I think we caught up at this point. I'm really sorry, Victoria. <laughs> I was meant to say next slide to Victoria I didn't. Um, shows when West House, which is now called Winside Manor, the, became the Sills kind of um, grand mansion uh, in, in remote bit of Dentdale and the monument to John Sill I, which was built by his um, nephew, John Sill II, which is in St Andrew's Church. And it's important evidence because it says, um, you know, that this is to John Sill, who died in Providence in the island of Jamaica, uncle and benefactor, 24th of December. So it's actually naming that connection, if you like, to Jamaica. To, um, from Jamaica to Dent uh, in the mid 18th century. And then the next slide was other Dent involvement that I've tracked so far, um, which I need to confirm. Um, so, which is Miles Mason. Uh, there's lots of Miles Masons in Dent, so it's more complicated than it seems. Um, and George Capstick, this Guinea um, captain, which Guinea captain means slave ship captain. Um, so hopefully I've covered, you can see the slides now. I um, apologize for that. Thank you. So I'm just going to open now and see if there's any questions. You can put questions in the chat or put your hand up if you have any questions for the Safafway um, talk that we heard from Reem and Alana uh, and Rachel this morning or any questions about the Dent Runaway um, story. Alan. Yeah, thank you, uh, Imogen. I thought that, um, and thanks to the um, East Sweet West group for their their um, stuff on the such white family. I, I'm I just wanted to ask about the the rumours in Dent um, around uh, black labour in um, on the, in the fields or or uh, in the um, quarries. Etc. Um, I've always been very highly sceptical of these rumours because um, it would be um, very unusual to mm -hmm. have black labourers, uh, black or, or Africans bought into um, Britain mainly um, were, yeah. were were highly prized in terms of you know. You know, we we you know, we want these people to show our wealth, and we want them to be dressed nicely and etc. I'm not saying that they were treated well at all, but I'm just sort of saying yeah. there's very little evidence. It's that the evidence is all in the West Indies of utterly awful, um, uh, you know, manual labour than them being put yeah. to awful manual labour, and it's not like dense one of many places where this is talked about. It's yeah. Dent is virtually the only place in Britain where 
there is talk of there being um, this kind of um, almost like using Africans in the same way as they were used in plantations in, in the Americas. Um, and I know that you come from there and it just seems to me that you might have some perceptions uh, that will help us because it seems, seems to me that there, there, is, there is not a historical weight of evidence in, on either side for this yet, yet. I thought about this a lot and um, as you can imagine and um, I suppose one of the things that I've been thinking about is how do we deal with this oral history? How, how, how do we, uh, this isn't, you know, history that we can ever dance and say, this is definitely what happened, this isn't what happened. But these oral histories are now part of the history of Dent. So we can't ignore them and say, well, just because we can't evidence them, they're not meaningful because they have history to the meaning of Dent. Um, as, as this sort of, that they, they have a meaning in themselves as stories that have been told for a very long time and handed down. And, I, and there's a big, as you will know, Alan, there's a big thing about was Dent the basis for the, the Brontes and Wuthering Heights? Was Heathcliff Black thing? There's lots of writing about that. I actually think that's less interesting than the fact that enslaved Africans were brought to somewhere as remote as Dent and that these oral histories exist and persisted um, for so long. And I suppose for me, thinking about it, it's like, well, you know, maybe those stories are not true in the sense that there weren't a lot, maybe perhaps there were not lots and lots of enslaved people brought as labour to Dent. Maybe there was one or two, which wouldn't be surprising, like Thomas Anson, that we have evidence of. But perhaps it was a way of making sense of the Sill family wealth. Because what we know for sure is that the Sill family had 200 enslaved uh, Africans on their plantation in Jamaica. They, we, we have evidence for that. We can look at the names and the name of Sill persists in the records and names of enslaved people in Jamaica in the slavery uh, uh, registers, in the slave registers. So in a way, perhaps there's a sense making that's making sense of the fact that this terrible thing was happening because, uh, elsewhere, <laughs> but it's almost tra becomes transposed into the history of the Dale as part. So there might be a way in which, you know, in trying to think about how we manage and think and use and think about that oral history, there's something about the fact that this terrible thing was happening and it was tied to the history of the Dale and it's brought back into <laughs> these events are sort of retransposed into the physical place of the Dale itself. And I suppose that's how I'm beginning to think about it, that we shouldn't just discount it yeah. and we shouldn't just, you know, fetishise whether it's connected to a, as a source for a literate, for a novel or not. But actually, what's really significant is that we know at least one black enslaved person was brought here. Perhaps there were others, but what matters is this: is that it, it is part of the history of the place, because it is part of the history of the place, whether the enslaved people were here or there. So that's how I'm trying to think about it at the moment: is how we make sense of that, um, that the persistence and power of those oral histories in the Dale are so significant. I, and I think you'll find uh, oral histories elsewhere in Bristol and elsewhere, which are kind of strange and don't have relevance specifically to history, but they're a way of explaining why all that wealth is there, but they're yeah. that aren't there in the great numbers. So yeah, no, I think that's great. Thank you. I think, I think just to add to that, I think I find it troubling just to dismiss those oral histories too, you know, yeah. they, they, because it is, they are part of the history of the place. So it's what we do with those. And I, there was another slide that I didn't include because I had too many at this point, but it was about a project that I think it was the Yorkshire Dales Asher Park did on, a, on Swaledale where there'd been... Um, a free black person had come, come who's the son, I think, of 
a slave associated business associated person and a free black woman had come back to live as a mixed race person in Swaledale and his family had lived there and, and then someone had done their family tree and discovered that they um, had this black ancestry um, in, in another remote dale in Yorkshire Dales and there's something about the way I could put a link to that but the way they dealt with that history I thought was very positive in that you know it was a kind of acknowledgement of that history and acknowledgement of black ancestry in these what seemingly deeply um, remote indigenous white places that seemed very important as part of the work uh, that we do uh, here. Um, so I don't know if those histories are true or not for Dent and, 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 and the, the, the idea of black ancestry being a powerful story about Dent, but certainly they're true for other Dales. So it wouldn't be completely out of the question that it was also true for Dent. Question, Imogen and Alana, thanks for your contribution. Could you speak more to the idea of regional wealth being generated from slavery and this not being acknowledged as it was not visible as life was in the plantations? Alana, do you want to say something about that? Uh, yes, um, I'll just read the question again. <laughs> Yeah, like I said in the um, in the presentation, it was just because Lancaster is so distant from the the visible suffering of um, of the plantations and of slavery that what like our local economy um, is just kind of ignored and the wealth that is generated in Lancaster and surrounding areas um, from say like cotton in the later periods and. Um, other like imports into Lancaster um, that you can still see today. Like you can see the Robert Gillows um, where they manufactured the furniture. Uh, yeah, so it's, I think that's all I have to say if you want to carry on. I think that's right, Alana. So it's that, it's thinking about how this business, you know, in, in, in Lancaster, and in Liverpool needed all of these goods to export it needed you know the wood to make ships the blacksmithing the iron making you know it needed these finished goods to export uh gunpowder um all kinds of goods that involved the whole region the whole area not just in Lancaster itself or in Liverpool even but the whole region was involved um Alan Alan's got the good story about bean growing. Alan, do you want to tell that? Yeah, I think I've told it before to these people, but there might be some new people on the call. Yeah, the um, uh, it's a farmer in Barrow. This comes from Melinda Elder's book, actually. Uh, a farmer in Barrow who has horse beans, and this suddenly there's a spike in his profits and the amount of horse beans he starts producing in the 1740s and 50s. And he's producing them for uh, for the slave trade. So what they're for is to provide protein for the slaves. So horse beans would normally be um, used for uh, animals, uh, but, but very cheaply produced. You can produce them in large numbers. He can make a good profit, and they they provide valuable protein for the slaves on the voyage. So and you know so so someone as far away as Barrow someone doing something as ordinary as making food for, for animals can start making a profit because of the slave trade. Oops. Yeah, and at the same time, it's interesting, isn't it, that we have these who's profiting. So when we think about, you know, profit coming in from this economy being stimulated, there's also exploitation going in on on a different level within 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 England. So we have these children being sent to down to these knitting schools, or we have people, you know, it, uh, children again, very often being indentured in cotton mills, etc. So you get these different scales or levels of exploitation where it's a particular class of people start to get wealthy from plantation um, from plantation business and from whether directly from transatlantic slavery or from the plantation business. 
but 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 there's another level of people who will be exploited labor um within England as well and very often in the 18th century that was child labor uh, and denture labor um Sunita's asking Reem a question. Reem, how has research in these stories into black women servants changed your own ideas about the role of slavery and how it affected black people? Reem? Yeah, hi. Yeah. I think after I looked after uh, these stories, it is just the feeling about, you know, how is a person is free getting to a new land with a new, uh, new land, new people, new language to live there with the, you know, um, um, all the rule for you to start it with uh, uh, as uh, work in a Martian. And then if you are good, you can go to inside the house as a maid servant. And uh, yeah, I think it is kind of, um, um, I, I think in that time, in, it is uh, something out of human being to be one of a black, you know, and everything is related to you because you are, you, your skin color. Um, some of the stories is very, um, very sad to hear about, but um yeah this is just point the things about how is the people living that time thank you reem and i've just put um i was just trying to put a link in the chat about the story of um Fran fanny cooker who you talk who you looked at as part of your research into yeah. Frances Elizabeth Johnson, try and get an idea what life might have been like. Because one of the things that's really clear from the runaway slaves database and, and other research like Alan's work is that people had quite, it's very hard for us to know what the status or life was like of black people because it veered from free black people to people who were more servants or indentured for a term or a life term of being a servant to people who were actually more like the status of an enslaved person. And you can see in the, if you look at the adverts in the Runaway Slaves database and you look at other research, that those statuses differ and we're always looking for clues about what a particular individual's life may have been like. At the time that Thomas Anson ran away from Liverpool in the um, mid 18th century, from the same period that adverts of sales of, of people uh, were, were, they were definitely enslaved, you know, they're being sold as a commodity or property at, you know, a pub in, in Liverpool, which, you know, so it's important to, that we understand that some of these people were enslaved and some of them were servants, more like servants, but permanently servants without a chance of freedom. And so there's this sort of variety of types of, of black experience in this period. And I think that comes across really well. And we have to look at it. Reem. Yeah, uh, the things is very interesting in all of this story is about how, um, uh, because we're not having all, more information about how is these people live in that time. And there is no evidence. We just um, trying to make uh, a compare, looking uh, for this evidence from this story to compare with another story. But sometimes I feel like some, you know, some of the women, they are like, like uh, if we talk about Frances Elizabeth Johnson and Penny Cooker, the two of them, they are, the, um, um, are one of the favorite slaves to this family. They talking about them, about how is the family appreciate them. And also we can, if we look to Penny Cooker, we feel like maybe in that time she is happy because she is going in a process, starting with seamstress until being to maid lady. 
And it is kind of, you know, after they get enslaved, they going to process and use that life and making a process to be a good enough. And yeah, it is something interesting, um, you know, especially because the history is not talking about all the all the side of uh, everyone life how it's be. Yeah, one of the things I found fascinating about the Fanny Cooker story that you can read about is that she went back, that the family travelled back to St Kitts and, and she didn't want to go with them, because maybe because she was worried about not, you know, becoming more, less free again if she was in St Kitts than she was at this point um, in, in um, Bristol. Um, and, and actually, but the idea that she returned with the family and that she saw her her old family, her real family, <laughs> back in St Kitts, I thought that was a very moving part of the, the, the Fanny Cooker story. And we have got evidence that um, Polly Safferthwaite went back to St Kitts because she appears um, at a baptism of her family. And that makes me wonder, did she take Frances Elizabeth Johnson back with her did she see her family again during her lifetime in St Kitts? And that amazed me because I didn't think about people travelling back and forwards in that way before um, I, I started reading about more about it. Um, you kind of imagine that once people arrived, that was it. But some, there was some travel, even by women in the 18th century, backwards and forwards, um, to see family in the West Indies. And sometimes they're taking these enslaved, enslaved servants back with them. I found that very hopeful in a strange way. <laughs> okay, and my daughter kindly bring me a cup of tea. Did you find that hopeful, Ree? And perhaps finish on a hopeful note. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it is it's very, very helpful, especially when we, you know, when we think about how is that, you know, black woman coming as a servant here to New Land and when they ask her to go back, she didn't like to go uh, until they uh, um, treat, the, treat her of dismissal if she not going back. And uh, yeah, uh, I think, yeah, it is a very interesting story. It's, yeah, but because we didn't have any information about the real story, how is the life there? We just imagination, lots of things about how is these people live there. Yeah. So, so that relates to the oral history, doesn't it? Some of what we know has has to come in the lack of some historical evidence from our imaginations and from collecting the stories of others. Uh, and these stories today are, are both stories that have got hope in them because, you know, we have um, Thomas Anson escaping. Yeah, just a small note. Uh, um, also about Fanny Cooker, she also afraid by John uh, Benny's, but she remained in the service uh, even if she gets afraid. Uh, and she prayed when she is just 16 years old. She, uh, I think she preferred that time to be in a service for that house and this family. And that kind of thinking about maybe she is uh, feeling comfortable and happy to be with this family. Brilliant. So at that point, we're uh, going to draw to a close. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining the Storytelling Cafe this morning. And we'll see you at our next Storytelling event. Thanks so much to uh, Lancaster Sewing Cafe for hosting Lancaster Black History Group again today.